You know, prairie birds are as, as fascinating as they are beautiful. Join us this week as nature photographer and guide Ron Hayes and I photograph sage grouse and sharp tailed grouse in the eastern high plains of Wyoming. I'm Doug Gardner, and your wild photo adventure starts now. Well, Ron, I'm really looking forward to getting out and photographing these grouse. Doug, this is a great time of year in Wyoming. Spring is probably my favorite of the four seasons. You've got the, the grouse, the prairie birds returning, the raptors are beginning to nest. It's just a great time to be a photographer, a great time to be out and experience everything that's available in Wyoming. Well, these, these grouse especially, they're fascinating birds to watch. You know, we're right in the middle of the breeding season and we're going to be on the lex, right, where they breed? Yeah. the the grouse species, all the grouse species, return relatively to the same area year after year, and those locations are called leks. Uh, they're traditional so that we can, we can go back, return to the same spot year after year. Unfortunately, in Wyoming right now, the grouse numbers are declining drastically. Right. Well, that's one of the reasons I was so anxious to come out here and, and photograph these magnificent birds, because I may never have the chance again if the numbers keep dwindling like they are. You know, so, and I noticed, you know, we're, like I said, we're in a prairie, so we don't have much cover. And if you remember back in a previous show a few weeks ago, we did a whole show on the art of concealment where we used the terrain and we also showed you how to build natural blinds as well as using uh, manufactured store bought blinds and adapting them to the surroundings where you're going to photograph. Well, this is a completely different scenario. You see, there's no cover hardly at all. The, the cover that we have that we're going to be photographing from is really very short prairie grasses and a couple different varieties of sagebrush like this stuff right here. None of which is any more than 18 inches to 24 inches high. So that's not a lot of stuff to hide in. For that reason, we're going to be using ghillie suits. It's just a multicolored string material that's sewn into a jacket and you can just come out in a, a flat area like this with just a little bit of brush and absolutely disappear. We're going to show you how this works. Tomorrow morning we're going to go up uh, right at the base of the mountain, the foothills of the mountain, and we're going to look at some sharp tail grouse. Looks like that's it. Those birds are going to head back over the hill, try to find some cover, maybe feed a little bit, but it looks like we're probably done for the day. Yeah, that was, uh, that was pretty cool. I'm glad to get that hot thing off my head. Yes, indeed. <laughs> but this is the trick, using these suits and blending in with terrain. Yeah, those birds were relaxed. They were right around us, actually literally circling us all morning. Yeah, we had them drumming right behind us and just, you know, displaying and you could hear them, but 
I wouldn't dare turn and try to look at them as much as I wanted to. Tell me a little bit about the, the biology of these birds. Well, they're a short grass, kind of foothills uh, type of bird. The sharp-tailed grouse are in higher numbers in different parts of the state. We have a limited number of sharp-tails actually around the area where I live. Sharp-tails will breed for approximately six weeks. Oh, is that long? And they'll, they'll be fairly active. The, the sharp-tails tend to visit the, the lek a little bit earlier than the sage-grouse and you'll get to peak numbers fairly early. The, uh, the reason that I like to photograph these legs early is because you get more females active early. As the females begin to, to be bred, then they move on and, and begin to nest, and you lo lose them off the leg. One of the hardest things for me in a situation like this is being patient in the morning. You've got to get in here before daylight to photograph any of these grouse species because they're going to, right at daylight, they're going to come and land on this lek. So you can't just walk into the area after they're already on the lek. You have to already be in there well before sunrise. Get everything set up, get everything quiet and still, get ready, and just patiently wait. Sometimes that means that you could be sitting for an hour or better in the dark, just waiting. And this morning, the birds came in actually a little bit before the sun rose and started strutting. And so I had birds around me and I could hear their behavior and I could hear their calls and the strutting and the stomping of the feet, but I couldn't see even see anything yet. There's no need to even move and look through your camera and start tinkering with exposures until you know you have you know, more than enough light to start photographing by. Now early in the morning, that light's gonna be really low as the sun just peeks over the horizon. And for that reason, you're gonna to have to jack up your ISO so that you can increase the shutter speed enough to stop the behavior of, the, of these animals. You're gonna have a whole variety of behaviors to photograph here. You're gonna have portraits of the birds sitting perfectly still. We had opportunities for the birds to, you know, spreading their wings and stomping their feet and, and making the little dance, the two males coming together and dancing around. Just this pretty fast motion, so you got to have a fast enough shutter speed to stop that action. A little technique that I personally use, I kind of alternate between adjusting my shutter speed and adjusting my, my ISO. Adjust the ISO high first thing in the morning, and then as soon as the light changes, I'll drop that ISO a little bit. Then as the light gets a little bit brighter, I'll increase my shutter speed. The next time it gets brighter, I'll drop the ISO again. And I keep going ISO, shutter speed, ISO, shutter speed. And that way I'm kind of getting the best of both worlds. I'm kind of taking advantage of high, the highest possible shutter speed I can get, as well as taking advantage of the lowest possible ISO I can get away with. Because remember, in low light conditions, the high ISO is going to create digital noise. So, you know, that can ruin your image. That can actually make an image appear very soft. Now, this morning, I was manually focusing for this. This would be a very, very difficult situation for those of you who only shoot in autofocus mode. Um, it can be done. Really, the only way you're going to be able to use autofocus, just wait for the animal to get into a clearing and then try to focus on him. Otherwise, you've got so much grass in the way and little tiny pieces of grass waving back and forth, you know, it could really cause your autofocus to jump off and, and affect your, your focus. One of the really nice things about this shooting situation is that the bird and the background is all neutral tone, almost perfectly 18% gray, halfway between pure black and pure white. So what that means is you don't have to worry about compensating your exposure or manipulating your exposure off of what the camera's meter is telling you is a correct exposure. So you can point that meter directly at the bird, or if you had the bird one third off um, to one side or the other of your frame, your meter would be getting a reading off the background. As long as the bird and the background are, or foreground are in the same light, you can trust what your camera is saying is a correct exposure. Most of the morning I was shooting around one eight hundredth or one one thousandth of a second shutter speed at about a thousand ISO and I was shooting at 5.6 and alternating between 5.6 and f8. 
Now, as that sun got brighter, I was able to bring my ISO down to about 600, and I was able to increase my shutter speed up to maybe 1 12 50th of a second. So uh, just trusting your meter in a situation like this is, is pretty easy to get a correct exposure. Well, we're done with the grouse for the day, but given the area that we're in and the diversity that it offers, I do know of an eagle nest that we could go take a look at. Cool. So Ron, how'd you get into photography? It was kind of by accident. Uh, graduated from college, went to work for the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, and immediately went into the, the mountains of Wyoming doing mountain fishery surveys, and just saw some things that I wished I could describe better for right. the people that I was talking to. And I well, was working with one game warden, and he, he lent me his camera one day, and I, I was able to ca capture some images. They weren't quality images, but right. They helped me to tell a story, and that was the beginning. Took off from there. Now, you born and raised in Wyoming? I am. I'm fourth generation from Wyoming, and my kids would be the fifth, fifth generation of my family from the state. And there's no better place on earth. I keep finding myself returning to Wyoming time and time again, and I'm never disappointed. It's yeah. an awesome place. So, Ron, where are you with your photography nowadays? Uh, I'm selling prints, selling stock and also do private tours for individuals, small groups, trying to get that shot of a lifetime, helping them experience what I've been able to experience all my life. That's awesome. Well, I tell you what, this is a cool place to stop and have lunch. I'm ready to shoot that uh, eagle nest. Sounds great. Let's get out of here. This is the eagle nest I was telling you about. I've uh, been watching it for a few years, and this time of year, they'll probably be bringing some nesting material back. We may get some passing shots. Uh, a lot of waterfowl, so they may be on the hunt as well if we get lucky. Yeah, I can hear geese and ducks on the river right over here. The bald eagle is a contrasty color. It's a very dark brown for 90% of its body, and then you have a bright white head and a bright white tail. So trying to get an exposure for this in very contrasty light uh, is quite a challenge. So what I'm doing today, I'm actually taking a meter reading off of the bluest part of the sky. And then I'm stopping down two thirds of a stop so that I don't overexpose the head. Now, my histogram is gonna tell me that I'm slightly overexposed anyway for the white head, but you've got to try to get some detail back in those dark areas. Uh, without you know overexposing the head too much. If the bird was predominantly white, then I would have stopped down a full stop to a stop and a third um, in, in light like this. My exposure for this bird right now is ISO 200, one one thousandth of a second at F8, and I'm getting almost a dead on exposure. I've got a little bit of, because of the contrasty light and contrasty subject, I am gonna have to do a little bit of touch up work in, in Photoshop in order to uh, get those light levels where I want them. Great bank shot. This is a great opportunity to utilize autofocus. You've got no obstructions, clear sky. Whatever focus point you choose, you want to try to keep it as best you can on that bird's head. With a little practice, following the flight path is going to become a lot easier. Also, if you can maintain at least an F8 aperture, it's going to be a lot more forgiving as you photograph these birds. You'll get a lot more feather detail and a lot sharper image altogether.
boy run. I didn't think that was going to happen this morning. We got in here a little bit late, later than we should have. Uh, we we're trying to utilize cover and come around the, the lek this morning so that we stay undetected as we moved in. And, you know, as you see for the sage grouse, our cover is even less than it was with the sharp tails. Taking that longer path, it proved to be a little <laughs> bit more work. And I, for one, overdressed for the morning. Oh, I did too, because we, we thought it was going to be like it was yesterday morning. You know, it is uh, uh, very, very cold yesterday morning, so I overdressed. And we, what we ended up doing is creating a big sweat bath and steam. And so I actually had a lot of problem this morning with my viewfinder fogging up from the steam coming up out of my shirt and I know better than to actually breathe on my viewfinder because that that has messed me up pretty pretty good over the years but um, but yeah it was uh, <laughs> it was a tough morning but it really turned out to be a fantastic shoot it was I my hope every time that I go out is that I'll be able to see something that I've never seen before and today we were very fortunate and not only to see the courtship ritual of these grouse but to actually witness a pair breeding right now just like with the sharp tail yesterday morning I had the same problem with that early morning light the color of it becoming overly saturated and I, yes I love to have nice warm looking tones in my images however I don't want it so warm that it becomes a, a distraction. So again, this morning, I had to dial that Kelvin down to about 42 or 4300. When that, that helped give me a more natural uh, tone to the, to the light because it was really orange looking this morning. The problem was especially prevalent this morning because of the white breast on the male. Now, exposing for the sage grouse is a little bit more difficult than what we had with yesterday's scenario with the uh, sharp tails. You have to be able to compensate for that big white breast on the male. And so I got a base exposure. Everything else in the scene is neutral tone. The rest of the bird and the background and the foreground that he's standing in, all that's neutral tone. So I know I can trust my camera's meter on that. However, to compensate for the white breast, if I left the exposure as, as it was, just basing it on neutral tone exposure, the breast would become blown out and you wouldn't have any detail in the white whatsoever. So I metered the neutral tone grasses around the bird and then I stopped down my exposure or took away two thirds of a stop of light. Now, as the morning got brighter, it, I actually took away one stop. Earlier in the morning, when the sun was just coming up, I was only subtracting one third of a stop of light. And that seemed to bring my exposure dead on the money. So first thing this morning, when that sun was first coming up, my exposure was one 250th of a second shutter speed with an f-stop of 5.6. And I had my ISO setting at 1600. And that's a, that's a little high. I, I really don't like going much higher than 1600 because of the digital noise issue. However, as that sun came up and I got more and more light, I started pulling my ISO down a little bit and increasing that shutter speed up a little bit because just like the sharp tails, these birds are displaying and that's movement and you want to freeze that action to, so you'll have tack sharp images. While the bird itself is not moving very fast, unlike the sharp tails, the sharp tails were running back and forth and chasing each other. We didn't have that type of fast action this morning. They were, these birds move very slow. They'll strut much like a turkey does. They'll drop their wings and strut a little bit and they'll come up and stop. And then they'll take a few steps and start strutting again. So you don't have to worry about a, the bird jumping out of your frame where you're having trouble keeping a composition because it's a fairly slow movement. But what you do have to be concerned about is the showy yellow air sacs on the breast. Now they'll blow those up and then puff the chest out and sl actually slap those air sacs together. And you can hear it on, on camera. You can hear that popping noise as they slap them together. And that's, you know, that's the type of behavior you want to try to capture in your image. Just a bird standing there without the air sacs inflated, uh, that doesn't tell the true story about why these birds are so fascinating. Doug, I'm actually surprised we had as good a morning as we did as the, the wind picked up. Sometimes these birds will just hunker down and, and go ahead and seek shelter, but they continue to display for us. And 
it was a tremendous morning. Yeah, it, was, it really was. This is this has been spectacular. You know, both the sharp tail and the sage grouse. Now I can't tell you which one is my favorite because they both have very unique characteristics and the way they display during their their breeding process. So, uh, but this is this has been spectacular. One thing to keep in mind when you're photographing subjects like this is look at the background. Make sure that you don't have a bird behind your subject because it'll make it look like just a big brown blob. You want to have a very defined edge to the animal uh, and by having the birds separate will we'll clean up your shot and it'll also improve the intensity of your composition. If you do have multiple birds in the frame and you can't get them to separate, try to wait until the birds in the background move to one side or the other so that it complements your composition. One way to control subjects in the background that you may not necessarily want to draw as much attention to as your subject is by using a large aperture, which is a small number like f4 or 5.6 or even f8. That'll give you enough depth of field that your subject itself will be in sharp focus, yet your background will be nice and blurred out, which will make the image pop out of the frame. When photographing birds like this, it's always a good idea to try to shoot with the longest lens you, you have. Not only for the reason of giving the bird plenty of room to act natural and undisturbed, but it also helps with isolating the subject out of the background, especially if you have a very cluttered background or if you have a background that, that has multiple birds and you want just one bird to pop out of the frame. Having that long lens allows you to really to hone in and isolate that one subject. It's one of the reasons I really like to use camera bodies that have crop factor. You know, it gives us that extra reach. Also allows us to isolate that subject and control our backgrounds. Absolutely, Doug. I use, I have a 500 millimeter lens with a crop camera. It gives me 800 millimeters uh, with 1.6 crop. And then if you add a 1.4 teleconverter onto that, you're over a thousand millimeters. So right. especially with a subject like the sage grouse where you want to use caution, right. it gives you the opportunity to increase your distance from that bird. Right, they are a very sensitive species. And we, again, I can't, we can't stress it enough. You, you've got to be careful when you're dealing with birds like this. I mean, they're on the decline and we don't want to be the cause of any, of any more of that. Um, however, it is, very worthwhile effort to record these behaviors before they're gone, possibly. Um, Absolutely. And we also talked about taking extra effort to conceal yourself properly. Um, not only does that allow you to get better shots, but it, it keeps the birds at ease as well. And you know you've done your job properly in concealment if the animal approaches you to a very close distance. And if that happens, you know, if the bird gets really close, you know he's too close for you to even get a shot of him, don't even try, don't, you know, don't even attempt to do that because if a bird is just a few feet in front of you, you're not gonna be able to get a shot that close with a lens set up and a camera set up like this. So any movement to even attempt something like that, it's just gonna spook the bird and, and, and cause him, you know, undue stress. But, you know, we had some, uh, with the sharp tails right up behind us that had walked Absolutely. up right behind us. We could hear them. We didn't dare turn and try to look at them, but we could hear them just a few feet behind us. And just by sitting still, we just let them do their thing, and they actually eventually came around and joined the rest of the group. Absolutely, yeah. It was, it was great to just be able to sit and listen to that, even knowing that there was no opportunity for, right. for a right. shot there. Well, Ron, the birds have moved on to cover now. I think it's time for us to maybe get a cup of coffee. Sounds good, Doc. What most see here is barren landscape. I see as wildlife-rich habitat. I hope you've enjoyed this week's show and learned a little more about the birds of the prairie. More information about this week's show and Ron Hayes' work is available online. And remember, it's not just about the photograph, it's the outdoor experience. I'm Doug Gardner for Wild Photo Adventures. I'm on my breeding leg. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Ooh, girl, you ain't gonna believe what that dude going for you. Mm-hmm.